The following podcast is a presentation of Project Entertainment Network. Welcome to the Sample Chapter Podcast, the show where authors read a sample chapter from one of their books. Here's your host, Jason A. Meiske. Hello, my friends. Welcome to episode 135 of the Sample Chapter Podcast. Oh my goodness, this week is an extra special one as I get to share with you my conversation with multiple award-winning and best-selling author, Hank Philippi Ryan. Oh my gosh, you're going to love this episode as much as I have. Hank and I talk about how she goes about writing effective suspense, how she fell in love with storytelling, you know, and so much more, including one of my favorite quotes of the whole thing, which is when she said, there's nothing more suspenseful than real life. <laughs> it's an incredible interview, followed by a gripping sample chapter from her latest bestseller, The First to Lie. That book is available right now. It came out August 4th, and I I am enjoying it. I've already dove into it, and let me tell you, you're going to want to pick this book up because it's incredible. All that's coming in just a few minutes, but first, I invite you to follow the show on social media, Facebook and Twitter. We're easy to find. It's just the Sample Chapter Podcast. It's also available on all podcast platforms, including a growing audience on YouTube. If you enjoy the show, please leave a rating and review on one of those favorite podcast platforms that you are listening to me on. And make sure you're sharing one of your favorite episodes with your friends and tell them all about this new author that you've discovered because of the show. If you have an author recommendation or you just want to reach out to me, you can do so via email at samplechapterpodcast at gmail.com or leave me a voicemail by calling 660-851-1146. And of course, as always, if I like your comment, if I like your review, or if I like your voicemail, which I like most everything, I'll play it or share it on, uh, on an upcoming episode. I also want to thank my wonderful sponsors, starting with you, Storall, who's been with us from the beginning. They are the number one self-storage facility out of Warrensburg, Missouri, the premier location for all of your self-storage needs. With two locations, both of them fully fenced, gated, and more than 60 cameras recording 24 hours a day, you can't ask for anything better. Let me tell you, they've got it on lockdown. They also have climate control and non-climate control, as well as LED lighting and running both facilities off of solar power. So check them out online at ustoral.net. That is spelled the letter U-S-T-O-R-A-L-L dot net. Hey, click the link in the show notes also for my favorite writing software, Scrivener. Scrivener's been with us for well over a year now. I love their service. I love that app. I use it every day. You know, just this morning, I was at a doctor's appointment. I had about 15 minutes to spare, opened it up on my phone, and uh, went right to work. And I got my words in for the day. It was, I mean, I had like 15 minutes and I got 800, 800 and something words done. I forget what the actual number was, but I wrote it down. (laughs) Anyway, uh, but it's because of Scrivener. Making it easy, I can back it up and then wherever I'm going, I open it right back up to where I left off. Check out this commercial and uh, make sure you listen up for how to save 20% on the regular desktop version. Jason here. Hey, I wanted to take a moment and tell you about my favorite writing tool, Scrivener. Now, I know you've heard about Scrivener because their writing software has been embraced by hundreds of thousands of other writers like you and I, from the novice to best-selling novelists. The reason we all use it is because of Scrivener's core concept to bring all the writing tools you use together in a single application. And with tools like automatic backup, character maps, project goals, and let's not forget that amazing corkboard, you can see why I use Scrivener every day. As a bonus for Sample Chapter Podcast listeners, use code CHAPTER for 20% off your desktop version. Scrivener writing software, built by writers for writers. Yes, indeed. Scrivener is where it's at. It's the best writing software made for writers by writers. Click that link in the show notes to check it out today. Hey, if you are a business and you're interested in, maybe you're looking to get word out about your business and you'd like to become a sponsor, please contact me at the aforementioned email 
Again, that's samplechapterpodcast at gmail.com. All the episodes here at the show are evergreen, meaning there's a backlist of all the episodes. So somebody could, you know, somebody from a year ago could find an old episode with their favorite author and they didn't realize they were on the show. And now they also hear your advertisement. So you never know when somebody might hear about your product because of an old episode. But if you'd like to talk about it, then reach out to me through email. Um, I have very reasonable rates that you're going to like, I promise you. Now I want to thank my podcast networks, starting with popgoestheculture.com. Those, those wacky people over there, everything pop culture related is right there at your fingertips. They have podcasts, uh, live stream shows, they have blogs, all your rumors, everything that you're looking for, pop culture related, movie related. Check out them and some of their other shows like Fanatics and the Fan, The Way Awesome Show, Amazing Nerd Show, Fellowship of the Geeks, Two Dads Review, and one of their new ones, Don't Push It Podcast. Oh, <laughs> and don't forget to check out the Multiverse Tonight show, which is pretty cool. So it's really, really nice, and uh, you're going to love it. And the uh, the flagship show, Pop Goes the Culture Podcast, will be coming back, I think, uh, here pretty soon. They are still ironing out some things for their upcoming season, but uh, yeah, you can still hear their old episodes as well. Click that link in the show notes so you can find out more about Pop Goes the Culture. And the other incredible podcast network that we are a part of, Project Entertainment Network, with 35 different shows on there and growing, I might add. Brand new shows like the Baseball Writers Podcast, Monster Men, <laughs> Hobbies Include Writing, Drinking with the Devil. <laughs> I have to laugh at some of these titles because they're just they're so awesome. Uh, Alien Beer, which is a science fiction stories podcast. The Horror Academics Guide to Movies, Unafraid, Glint of Mischief, Your New Opinion, and so many more. More than I can mention right here, but check out this advertisement for one of those shows. And don't forget to click the link in the show notes to find out more. How do people who make stuff up for a living make stuff up? New York Times bestseller Jonathan Mayberry told us... Oprah's book club favorite Sue Miller told us... You know, you sort of take a character and make some bad things happen. How'd we get them to do that? We colored them, just like at a cocktail party, except through your headphones. Join us every Thursday for the Liars Club Oddcast. A slightly unhinged podcast where storytellers interview other storytellers. Available on Project Entertainment Network, iTunes, and everywhere podcasts are heard. <laughs> there you have it. Another one of those incredible shows from the Project Entertainment Network. Well, without further ado, let's get on over to our interview with the lovely Hank Philippi Wright. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another exciting, very exciting episode of the Sample Chapter Podcast. This week, I have the very special privilege of getting to speak with Hank Philippi Ryan. Hank is a USA Today best-selling author of 12 thrillers, winning the most prestigious awards in the genre, five Agathas, three Anthonys, a Daphne, and the coveted Mary Higgins Clark Award. She is also an on-air investigative reporter for Boston's WHDH-TV, winning 37 Emmys, 14 Edward R. Murrow Awards, and dozens of other journalism honors. Without further ado, Hank Philippi Ryan, welcome to the show. Thank you. Coming to you from sunny Boston, where I think it's already already decided to be fall for some reason. <laughs> that's what happens in Boston. It's 90 degrees, 90, 90, 90, and then suddenly it's over. Uh, and no matter what month it is, it's chilly. So, But it's beautiful, and I love it here. I've lived here for a long time. So hello from Boston. <laughs> well, I'm so glad to have you on here. And, and yeah, it's been... I was in the 90s here just a couple of weeks ago in Missouri. It's always changing from day to day, it seems like. But all of a sudden, this past week, it's been in the 70s. And it's so nice. But this is my first chance to finally get to jump in the pool. And now it's too cool to get in my pool. So I can't do that either. Well, you know, we balance, right? We count our <laughs> blessings that the pool is there. And it's just waiting. For yeah, my wife points it out to me that, uh, well, if you can't get in the pool, then at least you can go do some yard work now that the weather's nice. Oh, thank you, dear. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm not sure that's the only option. Reading might be a good thing. I have some ideas for you. I agree. I agree. So how are you, and are you keeping healthy and doing well throughout this uh, this pandemic? 
Well, that's a great question. You know, that the question, how are you, is so fraught these days, isn't it? It's um, one of those things where I'm, we're well, we're safe, we're lucky. We live just outside of Boston in a big sort of Victorian style house and we have enough room and we have yards and we have flower gardens and a tiny vegetable garden. And, you know, I'm an author and I do my television reporting from home and my husband is a criminal defense attorney and he can work from home. So, so far, so good in a crazy, terrible world. I mean, it's just, it's a very difficult balance. It's hard to read, I think. And it's hard, you know, certainly difficult to write. Um, I had a very hard time concentrating the first several weeks, I think. There was sort of a veneer of terror over everything. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's just, I honestly, it's one day at a time, one hour at a time of sort of remembering to count blessings and trying to somehow see that we'll get through this. What about you? Has it affected you? It, you know, it has. Um... I'm I'm one of the essential workers, so my day job ended up. I'm the only person that could go to the office. Uh, everybody else is either senior age or uh, my other office worker is diabetic, so he's at risk. So he works from a home office now, and I'm the one that goes in, handles all the day-to-day -day stuff, goes from uh, different facilities, and so yeah, it's certainly affected uh, everything. Which is, <laughs> I had high hopes for 2020 and. My writing was doing wonderful. I had lots of goals and I was just looking over my writing numbers for the year. And July was my best writing month since February. And I could see a definite drop off from my daily word count to, uh, to until July when I finally started getting a little bit better acclimated and I could do the show and my writing and split the two. And it's, it's, I think I've reached that point of, uh, where I can, I can manage both again very comfortably and looking forward to a future date when it's not so, uh, things aren't as pressing. Exactly. I think we all search for equilibrium, don't we? Um, in mm -hmm. whatever we do. And even though equilibrium is terrible because we want to be <laughs> back to normal, normal, doing the best we can and sort of being kind to ourselves, I think is, um, incredibly important right now. We tend to, feel critical and you worry that you haven't done your words for the day. And, you know, I was sort of, my message would be sort of, yeah, how are you supposed to do that? You know, mm. just take it easy on yourself and be kind to yourself. And the fact that you're an essential worker is such um, a boon and a blessing to the people that you're helping. So, you know, be good to yourself, Jason. At this point. <laughs> you know, things will get better and your words will come back and, I'm I'm thrilled to hear that you're writing. Um, we can't wait to read it. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Well, all right. So let's talk about about you and and like I said, you've been an investigative reporter uh, with your history and journalism. Now, how does that come into play with your writing? Isn't that funny? It's interesting. You know, I grew up in really rural Indiana. Uh, so rural that you couldn't see another house from our house. And my sister and I used to ride our ponies to the library and get and get books. And then we'd fill up the saddlebags with books and read up in the hayloft of the barn behind our house. Mm -hmm. And I tell you this in answer to your question, because that's sort of what got me, you know, made me feel, felt, I fell in love with storytelling at that time. The idea that a wonderful author could weave a tale and lure you in and then keep you turning the pages until this sort of surprising but satisfying ending. I read all of Sherlock Holmes and all of Agatha Christie. And I remember understanding, learning to understand a little bit the architecture of a mystery and suspense and, and entertainment in reading. It was quite a revelation. But I, at that point, I thought, um, maybe I'd like to be be Sherlock Holmes rather than write about Sherlock Holmes. I mean, I thought it would be great to be a mystery author. And I used to go to the library, as I said, and look at the pictures of the authors on the books and think, you know, real people wrote these, you know, I, I can do that. Um, but then I thought, I don't know, maybe I want to change the world a little bit in a different way. So my career evolved, not in a straight line, of course, to being, um, a reporter. I started in radio in 1970, of all things. 
And again, in telling stories for radio and covering the news for radio and then television starting in, well, then Rolling Stone magazine for a while and then television starting in 1975, I learned, you know, I, I came back to that love of storytelling. I came back to that love of being able to draw people in with something that was important and interesting and compelling and educational and life changing. And, you know, and I, I, and the idea that I could illuminate and illustrate for people things that were happening in their world. They were just, you know, they were, they're real. It's factual. You know, I have 37 Emmys for investigative reporting and although every one of those Emmys represents a secret that someone didn't want you to know a secret that I dug out and uh, made public. And that's the connection finally to thriller writing, to crime fiction, to writing suspense, is that suspense too is all about secrets. Who knows a secret, who has a secret, who will tell the secret and what will be the result of that. So whether it's fiction or whether it's nonfiction, those turned out to be the same. Um, so then there was that moment, if we want to talk about it, when I thought maybe I could write fiction, not nonfiction. Yeah, well, actually, and I, I had a question I was going to say for a little while, but you kind of uh, wove into it a little bit, and, and you've already touched on it a little bit, which is writing effective suspense, which it sounds like it's about the questions, about the, it's about the mystery. How, how do you write such effective suspense? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the compliment. You know, it's interesting, but back 15 years ago, you know, after having written all these factual, well-researched, well-documented investigative journalism, journalistic stories uh, that were also suspense, right? Um, because I'm going out and looking for the story. I don't know the ending of a journal, a story that I do for television, um, and I'm in search of the story. And that is suspenseful in itself, isn't it? I don't know what the next phone call will bring or the next interview will bring or, you know, the next opened document will bring. And my mind is open to all the possibilities of what might happen in real life when I'm covering a story. And it's sort of the same in writing a novel of suspense. I, I don't know the end of my books, um, before I start them, I, I type chapter one and I have a little germ of an idea and then I just sort of see what happens. You know, Dennis Lehane used to talk about that a good book was taking a bunch of interesting people and putting them in a room together and see what happens. So it's kind of parallel. The, the, the path of covering an investigative story of seeking out something that's new and unique and compelling and riveting and important and life-changing and in the search for justice um, is the same exactly as writing crime fiction. You know, you want, there's a story with a beginning, middle, and an end. Uh, you have an important problem that needs to be solved. You have a character who you care about. You want the good guys to win and the bad guys to get what's coming to them. And in the end, you want to change the world a little bit. And, the, you know, it shows you, even from saying it out loud like that, how completely parallel investigative journalism is with crime fiction writing. So after, I mean, I've been a television reporter for 43 years now, crazily enough, um, and I've wired myself with hidden cameras and confronted corrupt politicians and gone undercover and in disguise, never knowing what's going to happen as a result of those inquiries. Um, and that is exactly the same path and pattern that I use in writing suspense. Um, I just am in search of the story. So when you say, how do I write such suspenseful novels? I keep myself in suspense as well. And that's what gets me to the computer sort of every day is I sit at my desk right here where I'm talking to you from. And I think, I wonder what's going to happen now. I wonder what's going to happen now. And that's the only thing that gets me to that desk. Is <laughs> I know that if I, if I don't write it, I'll never know. Oh my gosh! Yes, yes. And so it's, it's very much a uh, a situational kind of thing. It, do you find the investigations sometimes uh, putting a kernel in your mind of going, oh, but if it went this way, that, that would be a good story, uh, whether it's oh. fiction or or into your uh, report. Well, is it? You know, that's so fascinating. And that's such a good question because as an investigative reporter, 
you know, you try to think of every possible answer, you know, the ones that you haven't thought of, what could it really be? What if it's this way? What if it's this way? What if it's this way? And your only choice, of course, in, in investigative reporting is what's real. But in writing fiction, when you say, what if it's this way? What if it's this way? What if it's this way? And somehow you're a writer brain, and I know you know this, and have had this experience, your writer brain can play out an entire scenario just in this blink of an eye. And you can think that would work, or you could think, oh no, that'll never work. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's just, a, you know, the, the, the joy of a writer's imagination is so boundless if we learn to not be afraid of it and be open to any possibility, right? And that's exactly why investigative journalism works because we're open to any possibility. You know, you don't go in with this idea of what you think the story is because that's doom for a journalist. And you, I can't go into my novels with the idea of how the story will end because what if I've, what if I ignore a better story that would evolve if I just let it come to me as I'm writing? I know that's not how everybody <laughs> works. I know the outliners are out there going, Oh my golly, how do you do it without an outline? Um, but I'm just searching out the story. I'm looking for my books reality. And oh. there is nothing more suspenseful than real life, right? Um, and that's mm-hmm. sort of what I'm going for. When people say to me, oh, I, I, could, I, I, I was in that world. I, I could just see that happen. I just couldn't wait to find out what was going to happen next. That, that's like life, isn't it? You know, we, we don't know what's going to happen. Um, I, in fact, I, um, I did a whole TEDx talk about how sometimes I read the, don't do this, don't do this, listeners, but <laughs> how sometimes I read the end of books first so I know what's going to happen so the books aren't so suspenseful and I can learn how to uh, sort of deconstruct how the author did what they did. Oh, you know, yeah. I, I learn from that. As I said, now, don't read the end of the first to lie first. Please do not do that. <laughs> Um, but um, as an author, I can learn from that. So um, it's, it is all about suspense. It is all about page turning. You know, I want you to miss your stop on the subway um, because you're just immersed in the first to lie. That is, that is my goal. And I think that those, don't you think um, that the book emerges in the editing? The book emerges in the revision when you see oh, yeah. the book you meant to write. Oh, yes. Yes, yes, because I, so many times I'm following that that germ of an idea, and I think I know where it's going to go, but it, it just kind of something, a different thread will take over, or I'll, I'll go follow the rabbit down the whole one direction, and then eventually like, wait a minute, all right, let's go back a little bit and, and pick up where I left off. But then when I'm editing later, I'm finding things that I'm like, what in the world was I thinking here? let's fix that. Or I didn't touch on something that is important later. I got to add that. And it's those little details uh, that you pick up on here and there, or that maybe we don't even see until you hand it off to somebody else to read. And they're like, "Uh, you never mentioned this before. Well, you know, it's, or the, and it also works the other way is that you find something that you wrote that you realize in the revisions, you think, oh, that's why that's there. That's who was on the phone. That, you know, that's oh, who knocked yeah. at the door. That's why they put, you know, that's why they called at that time. You know, you, or that's why she has a dog. You, you you put things in that somehow your writer brain, your subconscious has you insert for a reason that you don't know. I, it happens to me at least. And or themes that evolve, you know, you see that you you know, that I've woven in this theme in the first to lie, for instance, of family, of loyalty, of honesty, of um, disclosure. Uh, and, the, you know, that's one of the themes of those are the themes um, of the first to lie, revenge. And then you, or you see how often without even trying to do it, those elements start to shine through the book as you write it. And I and I'm not sure. That can be planned. I think when you have a story that's a true, and I, by true I mean fictionally true, a true story that's really evolving, that the themes will present themselves in ways that the writer doesn't actively do, but that are there through the sort of magic. And I say that in the um, most technical of ways, through the magic of our writer imaginations. 
Oh my gosh, yes, I, I completely agree. And and it's such a great feeling to go back and find one of those spots that you did, and you're like, oh, I, I totally forgot I wrote that. Exactly. <laughs> Well, exactly. And you get goosebumps. I know, you know, when people ask me, how do I know I'm finished with my book? You know, after massive, massive revisions and reading it over and over, um, I've come to a point where I, and it happens every book, I sort of, I'm in the revisions, I'm just kind of reading it and mm -hmm. I forget that I wrote it. I'm just reading because it's a good story. <laughs> and then I, and tears come to my eyes every time. And I think, oh, I, I guess I'm done. You know, this feels, I'm not snagging on re repetitive words. I'm not thinking, oh, I'm trying to be such a good writer here. You know, those kinds of things. I'm just in the story. And that's how I know it's done. And I love that moment. I, you know, I, when I'm, I'm writing my 13th novel now, and I'm at the, that point where we all are, uh, we wind up in the middle thinking, what, whose idea was this? This <laughs> is the worst thing that anybody's ever written in their entire life. And I don't know how to write a book. And I've never known how to write a book. And I don't know how I did those other ones. But I sure can't do it now. And you just keep going. You know, you just keep going and wait for the book to re reveal itself as you persevere. I mean, I can't tell you, Jason, how many days I say to myself, just write another sentence, okay? One more sentence. And then I think, well, it'll be terrible. And then I think, well, okay, then write another terrible sentence. You can fix it later, <laughs> right? Exactly. Exactly. Yes, just, just write, start writing something mm -hmm. and see what happens. Uh, get the juices going, and then before long, you'll be, you'll be on your way. Well, so you have two series currently, the Jane Ryland and the Charlotte McNally. Plus, you also have a handful of standalones. Do you have a preference of what you like? Because I know your newest one, First to Lies, is a standalone. Uh, is there one that is more comforting to go back to, or is it nice to get back to that beloved character? Oh, golly, you know, it's really such a great question because the, those are such two such different endeavors to write a series and to write a standalone. And it's kind of fun to think about. You know, I wrote the Jane Ryland books and the Charlotte McNally series. Charlotte McNally is a, a television reporter in Boston who's worrying she's getting too old for TV. I really scraped the bottom with that character. Um, I don't know where that came from. Um, and they're funny and fast paced and first person. Um, and I love them. And then the Jane Ryland series about a, a newspaper reporter in Boston, young, much younger and much more new at her job who's on the search for the story that will keep her working um, and i and they're you know it, those are thrillers and multiple points of view so i evolved from that single that first person present point of view in the charlotte mcnally books that began with prime time my first novel which won the agatha for best first novel and that was sort of the beginning of my crime fiction career um, and then the Jane Ryland books, which also series, but bigger. They are thrillers. They are multiple points of view. And you can tell from a writer point of view that I was learning how to do this, that, you know, my first books were first person, as I said, and I was learning how to tell a story in 100,000 words. Then in the Jane Ryland series, again, a different character, but, you know, and in Boston, but different world, different people, different milieu, different um personality, different sensibility of the story, um, bigger, richer, thicker, more, more layered points of view and more layered multiple storylines interweaving. And so you can, you know, if you look at it kind of clinically, you can see that as a writer, I was growing into understanding how to write a little bit differently. Um, when I got the idea for The Other Woman, which was the first of the Jane Ryland series, I knew that plot that plot was too big for a, a, for a first person Charlotte McNally book. And that was kind of a real milestone for me. That was a moment of, I thought, you know, I'm going to stretch my wings a little bit here. And that worked. And then, for, you know, I, there are still more books to come in the Char in the Jane Ryland series, but then I had this idea for a standalone. Um, and my first standalone was trust me. Um, which I adore, and I and it and got such a claim. And the the thing that was great about realizing about a standalone is that in a series, 
you do have your you have your main characters that the reader loves and the reader is connected to Charlotte McNally or Jane Ryland and Jake Brogan, her partner in crime in the Jane Ryland books, Detective Jake Brogan. You know they'll be fine. You know, you know Jane and Jake aren't gonna die because in book five, because there's book six. So the, the the suspense for the reader can't come from the mortality of the main characters because we know they'll live. The, they're going to be fine. It, the, the suspense and the page churning elements of it have to come from the idea that you're on another adventure with people who you care about, main characters who you care about. But in a standalone, like my first one, Trust Me, or the USA Today bestselling The Murder List, or my brand new bestselling The First to Lie, you know, the reader's expectations are different because anybody could be good and anybody can be bad. You know, the person you meet on the first page, you know, we expect sort of that person to be, we're going to be on the train with them throughout the book. But in a standalone, maybe not. You know, anybody could be good. Anybody could be bad. Anybody could start bad and turn good. Anybody could be lying. And anybody can die. Anybody can die. In a standalone. And when I realized the power of that, that the reader's only expectation is that this is a really good story, but wow, I have no idea what's going to happen. <laughs> it's a big deal. And that's a lot of power. And I just sort of rub my hands with delight when I think, okay, okay, readers, watch this. Watch how I'm going to take your expectations and pull the rug out from under you. And, you know, when I get emails from people saying, Wow, I finished the first to lie and I went back and started reading it again just to see how you did it. You know, just to see how you did it. And that is one of the joys of my life to hear people say that because I want them to be turning the pages as fast as they possibly can. And then in the end, to think, wow, I should have seen that coming. Or even in the middle, to think, wow, I should have seen that coming. How did she do that? And as an author, that is my total goal. Oh my gosh, so much good stuff here. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just loving this conversation. <laughs> well, so nice of you to invite me. Thank you. Oh my gosh. So the first to lie just came out August 4th. Uh, so just a couple of weeks before this will air. It's a chilling psychological thriller uh, that I have a copy of it. It's, it's right here on my to be read file with my Kindle. And I cannot wait to dive into it. What can you tell listeners um, to expect? Well, good question, and thank you. I love picturing it there on your on your desk. Um, I can't wait for you to read it. Um, you know, the first to lie, there was a great thing on Twitter, if that's not an oxymoron, there's a great thing on Twitter that says, tell, tell, tell about your book in four words. And so I thought, okay, let me do that. And that in the first to lie is betrayal, motherhood, obsession, and revenge. Betrayal, motherhood, obsession, and revenge. And it is a it is a dark look at the inside of pharmaceutical industry, certainly, but it's also personal. You know, I I don't want to write about the pharmaceutical in industry and I don't want to write about deception and disclosure and lies and misleading and the desire. Uh, of a pharmaceutical company, the calculus that a company like that has to make between um, who's helped and who's harmed. So put just tuck that all away and think about the characters. Think about people you care about. So if you look at it um, in the five things, like Facebook has you do, Facebook says, tell five things about your book. And I would say a devastating childhood betrayal an undercover reporter who's in too deep, a beautiful sailboat on the Chesapeake Bay, a rich and powerful family, and an ice pick that is not used for ice. So bottom line, the first to lie is two strong, smart women facing off in a high stakes psychological cat and mouse game to get revenge for a terrible childhood betrayal. But which woman is the cat and which woman is the mouse? And that is the essence of the first to lie. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Well, you know, uh, previous authors, if I've talked to you about your book, um, I think it just got it just got bumped. I think this one just went up my list a little bit higher. So, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <But I'll, laughs> 
thank you so much for coming on the show. I would love to just sit here and talk to you more, but I know I know you've got a busy day ahead of you, and uh, I, this has just been so much fun and uh, truly an honor to get to speak with you. Well, an honor to speak with you, too, as well. We have to stop meeting like this. Um, but, I, but I love your show. I've listened to so many episodes, and I always learn something, and I'm always delighted by hearing those chapters. Oh, bless your heart. I really appreciate that. Where can people find and follow you? Oh, my goodness. Well, anywhere on social media. It's terrible. On Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter. Um, I'm there way too much, at Hank P. Ryan on Instagram and Twitter. Please find me. and. Hank Philippi Ryan author on Facebook. Um, it's I have to drag myself away from it from time <laughs> to time and make myself right. But especially these days, it's so wonderful to be able to connect and chat with people um, via social media. And my my uh, website, HankPhilippiRyan.com. If you click on contact, that comes right to me with no intermediate people in the email. So if you click on contact on hankphilippiryan.com, I will get your email uh, and answer it. So thrilled to do that. It's my favorite thing. Uh, outstanding. Uh, wonderful. And I will definitely have links to all of this in the show notes, everyone. So make sure you are clicking there to pick up this book and find more about Hank Philippi Ryan. Again, thank you so much for uh, taking time out of your day and coming on the show. This has been a delight. My <clears> pleasure. <throat> I, I love talking with you. And plus, I'm supposed to be writing right now, so this is much more fun. <laughs> well, that's very nice of you to say. I, that's, that's good. Glad to hear it. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, time for me to step aside with my cup of coffee, and I'm going to listen along with the rest of you to Hank Philippi Ryan and her latest chilling psychological thriller, The First to Lie. So this is a little bit from Chapter 11. And who we meet in Chapter 11 is Nora. Um, when we meet her for, at the first, in the first chapter, she calls herself Nora for now. Um, and we will just leave it at that. So here's Chapter 11, entitled Nora. Nora's cell phone rang, echoing through the car's Bluetooth. Caller ID unknown, the readout said. She pushed the phone button on the steering wheel as she stopped for the light at the intersection. Snow had started to fall, a gentle dusting this Tuesday morning, but the steely clouds looked full, graphite and forbidding. She flipped on her wipers, the slowest speed. Nora Quinn, she said into the phone speaker. The light had barely turned green when the driver behind her honked impatiently and swerved his SUV around her, passing on the right, then pulling in front of her, brusque and demanding. Boston drivers, Nora thought, men. A white silence came through the open Bluetooth line as Nora blended her car into the traffic. She was headed from her morning appointment to a bustling sandwich shop in the impersonal retail chaos of the Shoppers World Mall a short order, short term respite where she could catch up on paperwork and then phone in her morning report, another worker bee in the buzz and hustle. Hello, she answered again, maybe a wrong number or a robocall. She frowned, poised her finger to disconnect. It's Caitlin, Caitlin Armistead from yesterday morning. Oh, hi, Caitlin, of course. Nora's brain spooled out the possibilities, almost getting ahead of itself. She reminded herself of who she was and what she wanted. How's it going? Silence again. Nora kept silent too, allowing Caitlin her emotional space. If she had gotten good news, no doubt she'd have yelped with delight, the words pouring out. Silence meant disappointment, and it made Nora feel guilty. Nora heard Caitlin sniffle, choke back a sob or a wail. It's, it's not good. Nora steered her car into the tangle of the shopping center, trying to concentrate on the parking place hunt without getting bashed by texting teenagers or grocery shoppers in oversized SUVs. She slid into a spot close to the highway, no one on either side of her, and left the car running. She didn't want to have this conversation and drive at the same time, but maybe she wasn't going to stay here. Where are you, honey? Nora asked. Flakes of powdery snow began to dot the windshield, each a unique treasure melting in an instant. 
Nora stared through the thickening flurries and out onto the highway, the swish and flash of traffic and flapping windshield wipers, the changing lights muddled by the quickly intensifying white. Squalls, they called them around here. Snow in an instant on a previously sunny day. Nora watched the cars in front of her blur into a stream of motion and counted her blessing she'd pulled into the parking lot and that her next appointment was within walking distance. I don't know what to do. I, I can't stand it. Caitlin's voice buzzed over the car's tinny speakers like there was sudden snow in the transmission, too. I had to go back to Dr. McGinty again today for my final, final results. Can you believe it? As if I wasn't just there just yesterday with you. And it got my hopes all up again, like maybe there had been a mistake. But no, it's still awful, still horrible, still the worst thing ever. And still their fault. And today it's like, oh, we know we told you yesterday, but now we need to tell you the bad news again. Nora heard the tears in Caitlin's voice, the sorrow. Are you driving, Caitlin? Where are you? Is it snowing? Maybe pull over and then we'll talk. No, no, I can't stop. I have to get home. Caitlin drew out the word like a plea, home. I'm only to the reservoir by that movie theater. Caitlin, seriously, Nora kept talking as she shifted her car into reverse, backed up and pulled into traffic. Lunch could wait. Pull over. I'm on my way. I'm so sorry to call you, and I know it's crazy, but it's not going to work. It's never going to work, and we don't have any more money, and I think... Nora eased onto the highway, nosing in front of a pokey sedan, skating through a yellow light that turned red while she was still in the intersection. She accelerated, gauging the traffic, gauging the distance, gauging the snow, Caitlin's voice growing taut and insistent. I really think they tricked me, Nora. That doctor knew all along this might happen. He said he'd warned me, but he didn't. Caitlin, are you sure he didn't warn you? I mean, maybe you missed it, or maybe he didn't make it seem like a big deal. A red light glowed ahead of her. She had to stop. She punched Framingham Cinema into her GPS near where Caitlin must be. She could get Caitlin to tell her what happened to see if doctors like McGinty and Hawkins and the rest were misleading patients about what Monofan might do. Caitlin might be the very person she needed. The light turned green. Caitlin hadn't said a word, but through the car's speakers, Nora heard sounds of horns and windshield wipers. Caitlin, you okay? Pull over. We need to talk, okay? He didn't warn me. He didn't, and I told him so right to his face this morning, and I told him I was going to... Focus on driving, okay? Nora didn't like the edgy panic in Caitlin's voice or the sounds of sniffles and tears. We'll talk when I get there. I am, and I'm driving fine, but I can't believe, after all this time and all his promises, Nora heard a little gasp as if Caitlin was choking on her tears. I know, I know. Nora kept her voice quiet, reassuring. We'll figure something out. Just give me time to get to you. Four minutes away, Nora's GPS promised. If the weather weren't so treacherous, she might make it there sooner, but she had to drive carefully. She still wasn't used to Boston's winter or its lack of road rules. Is there a Starbucks, something like that? Nora tried to remember that area. Her windshield wipers flapped, persistent. Two minutes, her GPS said. Can you see any place nearby? I really want to talk to you, and you're in no shape to drive, Caitlin. All I wanted was children, another sob, like I told you, and I told him that, and he promised me, promised that it would work, and now I can never. Nora pressed her lips together, concentrating on the road, concentrating on everything, feeling something beginning and something ending, and Caitlin was the key. I'm coming to get you right now, Nora said, taking a chance, swerving into the right lane, then back to the center, feeling her tires shift and slide. Her car seemed as unreliable as her emotions. Pull over. Stop. Just wait for me. Nora, Nora, I am so, I can't even see straight. I told him that McGinty, that liar, right to his face, that I'm calling the news. I'm calling every reporter I can think of and telling them this doesn't work. It not only doesn't work, it, uh, I swear to God, Nora, he never, I'm with you, I am, but it's hard to listen properly and drive at the same time. Caitlin had threatened McGinty. She wanted to spill to a journalist. Nora's stomach twisted. That could change everything. They needed to talk, and now. 
Seriously, Caitlin, could you do me a favor and get off the road? Is there a gas station someplace we could meet? And James, I called my husband James, and he's a mess, and now he's coming home, and I have to decide how to talk to him about it in person, which will be awful, and he'll be so angry, like it's my fault again, and it's not. What kind of a car do you have, Caitlin? Nora interrupted, tried to keep her voice calm and soothing. GPS showed the cinema less than half a mile away on the highway. So I can find you? It's a white hatchback, she said. A Civic. A Civic. Hatchback. Nora pictured that. Okay, a small white. And now, Caitlin interrupted her thought, I have to decide which reporter to. Damn it. Caitlin. Caitlin. Hey, watch it. Caitlin's voice had changed, high-pitched, annoyed, then frantic. Watch it. Caitlin, you okay? Brake lights appeared ahead of Nora, blinking on in unison as if they were synchronized, red and red and red, glowing through the blustery snow. She slowed, craning her neck around the chain of cars lining up in front of her, blocking her way. Caitlin? She heard sounds through the speaker, wrong sounds, sounds like metal and yelling and horns. Hey, she yelled, and Caitlin, but no answer. A flash of white noise, then silence. She yanked the wheel to the right, rumbling through the narrow pothole breakdown lane, needing to get there, hoping she wouldn't see what she had heard, what she'd imagined, hoping there would be another explanation, her teeth clenched and fingers grasping at the steering wheel. Horns and more horns now, and other cars moved in her way with their own needs and their own goals and blocking her way to whatever had happened. She honked, too. She had to get those people to move, to clear a path, give her room. She heard the blare of sirens and saw more red lights, their intense colored beams sweeping across the snow. A tiny graphic pinged onto her GPS, then blocky words. Crash ahead. Seek alternate route. Oh my goodness. Wow. That was incredible. And that was Hank Philippi Ryan reading a sample chapter from her latest chilling psychological thriller and bestseller, I might add, The First to Lie. I'm enjoying it right now myself. I know you're going to want to do the same, so click the link in the show notes for more about Hank and her books. While you're in there, click the links on our sponsors and podcast friends alike, and make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out next week when we return with C.M. Adler and A.K. Alexander, the writing duo behind The Deadly Affairs. You don't want to miss it. Take care, everybody. We'll see you again real, real soon. This has been a presentation of the Project Entertainment Network.